We are continuing our study of, of prayer, and I'd like us to look at kind of an obscure, interesting story in Matthew 15, 21 through 28. I hope that you've been blessed by this study. Sometimes we're guilty of feeling as though we have arrived and that we know it all. And it's kind of neat when we pause and we consider uh, this great subject of prayer and we look at different scriptures and examples and we stand it in, in all of these, uh, these great uh, people of God, uh, we quickly realize that there's much to learn. There is much for us to, um, to, to grow and, and to excel in, in the ways of, of God. But I'm very excited about looking at this text this morning. Matthew 15, 21 through 23. Let's listen to the word of God together. God's word says, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you as you desire. And your daughter uh, was healed. And her daughter was healed, that is, um, instantly. Look now at verse 21 as we walk through this text together. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are located on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea in the northwestern region of Israel. These cities were formerly known as centers of trade. They abounded uh, in riches and op opulence, as well as uh, they were known as places of great wickedness. And the reader can't help but sense that Jesus is in the wrong place. Jesus has left the camp of orthodoxy, and he has gone to the region of religious outcasts. He's going to a place noteworthy for ungodliness. Look now at verse 22. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. As we have mentioned, this woman was from the wrong place. From a first covenant perspective, she does not have the right bloodline. She's not a descendant of Abraham. Therefore, she has no claim to his blessedness. Nevertheless, she has a need. Her daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. In the New Testament, there are many different ailments that are directly 
attributed to the work of the devil and to demons. Here we don't have specifically what this ailment was, but we may infer that it was serious and a great uh, trouble to her mother. To the extent that she cries in this manner, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Mankind could rightly be classified as desperate for God. However, rarely we see that he comes to this realization. Here she has an enlightened understanding. She fully understands how desperate she is for the Lord Jesus, and she realizes her insufficiency. For instance, how many in Israel were there in this day that were desperate for the Lord, yet we don't see this boldness and this humility by which she approaches the Lord. But notice very interestingly here the Lord's response in verse 23. But he did not answer her a word. Jesus completely ignores her. It's nothing but silence. And perhaps we can relate to this experience in prayer. And and maybe sometimes we feel this way as we call upon God, as we lift a request before him, it, it feels as though there's a great barrier between us and heaven. And all we hear is silence. This woman accurately discerns the person of Jesus. She attributes to him this messianic title as the son of David. She comes to him with reverence. She acknowledges his authority to drive out demons. And she presents before him her great need um, of of her daughter. Yet Jesus remains silent. He does not answer her a word. I want to consider why this is. First, her request is outside of God's timing. His ordained chronology for the blessing of the nations. And so it's not the right time. It's inappropriate for her to ask these things of Jesus at this particular time. We'll unpack this more in a moment. But secondly, I want you to consider that Jesus is silent in order to allow her to work out her faith. Jesus's silence acts as a test. It is through tests and trials that the righteous are afforded the opportunity to display their great faith in Jesus. This is the only place that faith might be proven and shown. Christ's silence provides a stage for her faith to be put on display before men and angels. Christ's silence allows her faith to triumph over unbelief. Jesus' silence allows her to distinguish herself from all others. In fact, many have been found to lack this choice virtue when put to the test of silence. When heaven does not respond, many of us fall away. We we quit um, our our pursuing him, and we, um, we, our faith dies uh, quickly um, at this first test of, of silence from, from Jesus. And so the Lord's silence allows her to work out the importunity of her faith, this untiring boldness and holy persistence to continue in prayer until she has that for which she seeks this character, which is so precious in the eyes of God. 
And I want us to let this soak in this morning that, that faith must be given the opportunity to prove itself. We cannot prove our faith when we sit on the sidelines, when we're resting on our heels. But faith must be proven in the time of trials and testing. It is in the crisis. It is in the time of need. It is in the day of battle that faith may be shown to have um, its its full power and may work and may uh, be be shown to be true and, and pure. And so Jesus is silent to her request. Now see the way that the disciples respond. So we continue reading, and his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. And so she reaches the second test of her faith. And I want us to put ourselves in her her shoes. What if these mighty apostles, such as Peter, James, and John, had said to you, had had said to to send this person away. Think about how faith-crushing this could be. These people of such distinction, these men of renown that are calling for this woman to be sent away. And then in verse 24, Jesus breaks his silence. He answered, I was sent only for the lost sheep of Israel. I was sent only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Here Jesus gives the reason why he has denied her. He gives the reason for his silence. She's asking for a blessing just before the times of the Gentiles. At this time in history, the Lord was working exclusively with the Jews and the promises were shortly to come to all nations. This time uh, of fulfillment was to be uh, the time of, of Pentecost and the establishment of the church. Her prayers are bigger and bolder than what meets the eye. She's asking to be treated with favor in a time prior to Gentile inclusion. Jesus, as he tells us, has been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. It is not until the establishment of the church through Jesus' disciples that the promise of Abraham might be given to all people. This makes her prayer all the more scandalous. And perhaps the disciples' response, send this woman away, is less um, um, less out of, of cruelty or out of a, a lack of love, but more to indicate the times in which the Lord is, is operating. And so despite these um, statements uh, from the disciples and the Lord, this woman is unwilling to give up in her pursuit of the Lord. And I think of Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, if we turn back just a few chapters at what Jesus says here. For from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. In a sense, this woman is forcing her way into the kingdom of God. She is not accepting no as an answer. In her desperation, she's unwilling to wait for the times of of blessing when she sees the Messiah standing right in front of her. And so we read in verse 25, But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. Verse 26, and he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. 
To this point, Jesus has been silent. He has ignored her. The disciples have said, send her away. Jesus has responded the first time and said, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And now in this fourth test of her faith, we read the following. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Here we have four decisive points at which her faith could have failed, especially at this last point where Jesus explicitly refuses to grant her request. What is disclosed in this narrative is the excellence of her faith and its purity. It is a choice diamond among endless rubble. If her faith had not been pure and solid, it surely would have failed these tests. Against this mountain of resistance, she strangely presses forward. Now as we read in verse 27, she said, Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus, in all of her response, says the following. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. It is quite a wonder to pause and to consider uh, this, this woman and how noble her faith was. To notice here her use of, of argumentation, to reason with the Lord this theme that, that is associated with, with prayer that spans throughout uh, both covenants. To see her use this, this form of, of negotiating with, with deity, it is, it is a wonder. This is uh, something that if we are to be successful and prevail in prayer, the Lord would have us to learn this, this art of, of reasoning with the Lord. It's, it's interesting here that she doesn't appeal to any scripture, but she simply appeals to the logic of God's world and, and the way that things are. And this so touches and, and captivates the heart of God. It, it brings to mind uh, examples of, of the Psalms, and it brings to mind such figures as, as Moses and Abraham, men that we lift up upon a, a pedestal, these these leaders of, of nations, these fathers of, of nations, these great um, heroes of, of our uh, religion, these men who negotiated with the Lord, who reasoned with him, who in a sense argued with the Lord, who brought promises before him, here we see this outcast, someone at the very bottom of the, the barrel, the lowest uh, point in, in society. Here we see this weak, despised, hopeless Gentile who comes before the Almighty and is able to reason and negotiate and not accept no for an answer when Jesus clearly says, no, I cannot do this for you. I'm unwilling to answer your prayer. What does she do. She reasons with the Lord. She argues with the Lord. She appeals to his kindness and his mercy that just the smallest portion of his infinite blessing might be afforded to her. This, this text is incredibly instructive to us in a number of ways. In Scripture, we see that extremes 
are used in order to stress uh, the importance of, of God. For instance, we have God who many times he works through the weakest of, of people, and it highlights the power of God that, that salvation is of the Lord and of the Lord alone, that all glory, all power um, resides with Almighty God, but also as, as an encouragement. It might be intimidating for us to consider Abraham or to consider Moses, these great men as they speak before God, as they reason, as, as Moses uh, reminds uh, the Lord and, and, he, uh, and he reasons and negotiates for uh, the, the people of, of Israel. How could I have the ability to stand in the shoes of of Moses to stand in, in the breach to intercede on behalf of, of my generation. But in this text, we have assurance and we have encouragement that we consider our standing. We are not spiritual outcasts, but we stand upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. We have greater assurance to stand before the Lord, for our faith to uh, persevere, to continue, and to not lose heart. And we have a greater standing to negotiate with the Lord. We have the whole counsel of, of God. We have promises in the Old Testament. We have uh, endless promises in the New Testament that are given for us. We can remind the Lord of these things. Lord, consider what you have said in your word regarding your people. When are you going to fulfill these promises in my life? When are you going to fulfill these things in your church? In this day, do for us what you did in days of old. We have endless encouragements in the word of God, that our faith should withstand um, these different trials in a far greater way than this uh, woman had the ability uh, to stand upon faith against all these obstacles. Consider the driving motive of her faith here. She was driven by compassion a compassion that language fails to express. Her daughter was severely, uh, severely oppressed by a demon. And so her heart was full of compassion, of this love. In a like manner, we need a cause. We need a, a purpose. We need to consider the works of, of the Lord, the advancement of the church, the salvation of, of the lost, the, the saving of, of souls, and our hearts need to be filled to the brim and overflowing with compassion, and this compassion should drive us to action to seek mercy from Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And notice also, as a driving motivation, she was a woman of rare and choice, exceptional faith. And her faith was founded upon the son of David. Surely she had heard of his fame. Surely she had heard what he had done for other people. And she believed that he was the man of, of God. He was the son of David. He was the promised Messiah that the hope of the nations rested upon. The longing of the people of that day were looking for when Jesus was going to arise on the scene. And so her faith was founded on Jesus Christ. And both of these, her compassion and her faith, expressed themselves in action. This is a point I want to get across this morning, we cannot express our faith as we sit on the sidelines. Faith is something which is active. It must be put to the test. It must, 
show itself. It must interact with the world that we live in. Faith must be put on display in this congregation, in this community. It must be living and active. It must work in the midst of God's people, in the midst of this broken generation in the United States of America today in 2020. Our faith must be put on display before witnesses in heaven and on earth for people to see these things. And I want you to once more consider the four points which assaulted this woman's faith. Can you imagine as you come and you cry for mercy before Jesus Christ that he is silent and he does not speak a single word 90 plus percent of people would turn away at this point and may the spirit of the living God convict us this morning for when we have come before the, the Lord with a a holy cause when heaven has been silent and we've just walked away and we've quit at this first uh, test of our faith. And secondly, consider how men, how the disciples said, send her away. How the devil will use all types of people, even the righteous, those in the church, in order to kill our faith, to extinguish our faith. How many fall at this test? And then we see that Jesus responds and he says, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, sent to the house of Israel. And how appropriate and fitting would it be for her at this point to lower her head and to walk away and to give up on her just cause and, and on her need and for her faith to die on this hill. And then finally, for Jesus to clearly, specifically deny her request and say, it's not right. It is not right for me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. For him to say, no, I am not going to answer your prayer at this point. How fitting would it be for her to walk away and to give up? And consider that God has given us the whole counsel of, of God. He has given all the promises have come to those at the end of the age. They have come to the church. We have given the, we've been given the full counsel of God. Everything that God has ever said has been poured into our lap. We have a standing with, with God. We have confidence in, in faith. And therefore, we should be able to withstand greater tests of our faith than this, this woman. And we need to understand uh, the, the design here. We need to understand and discern the, the test which is coming upon this woman. We need to understand that as we pray, God looks for persistence. He looks for importunity. He looks for those who are willing to wrestle with him and to not give up until they get the blessing. And how much more confidence should we have for our faith to rise to, to higher levels than this outcast? Very little was given to her, yet her faith is, is something which Jesus uh, commended. He, he praised Woman, great is your faith. And in the same way, we should have so much more um, assurance and our faith should uh, be of such a, a higher degree. And on that last point, there is a level of, of, of mystery there when the Lord, for some reason, says no. But, but once, once again, just like in the story of, of, of Moses as he stood in the breach, God 
expressed his will to wipe out the children of Israel. But what does this man of, of God do? He doesn't accept that answer, but he appeals for mercy and the uh, salvation of his people in the same way we need to learn this art of negotiating with the Lord, reminding him that it is in his interest to preserve this nation, for him to have mercy on Texas, for him to have mercy on Dallas. It is in his interest to pour out his kindness, to be gracious to the Main Street Church of Christ, to be patient with us, and to consider his promise promises in regard to us. And it is a, a, a great and marvelous thing to understand this, and without a doubt, the Lord takes immense delight in those who have a faith that will not even accept no for an answer. My prayer this morning is that we would consider this great example, that we would understand how it applies to us, that, that faith might be conceived within our soul, that if we've quit praying because we feel as though the Lord has been silent or other people have de deterred us, or even um, the Lord is, is slow and, and maybe it's time to take things to the next level in, in prayer and to remind the Lord of his faithfulness and to negotiate with him and to call on his, his name in, in desperation. And so I believe that the application is clear. Foremost, it is, it is plain to us that this teaching uh, may be understood as it relates to, to salvation. How much uh, more in, in, as we come to Christ should we call out to him um, for, for mercy, for the salvation of our, our souls. And so this morning, if, if you uh, do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we are commanded to turn away, to change our minds, to repent, and to be immersed in water, to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins um, in order that we might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If it is your desire to express your faith this morning, to call upon the name of, of the Lord, and maybe you feel like an outcast like this, this woman, and I, I, I pray that God would give you um, uh, faith in order to to trust that even though you are uh, on the on the outside of of his his camp, that he has come to save um, all people, and that faith would arise, and that you would not accept to be lost or to be separated from God, but you would boldly come forward and press into the kingdom of God and receive salvation uh, this morning. If there are any other prayers of, of the church, I would also encourage you uh, to come forward as we stand and sing our song of invitation.